This Week in Radio Tech, episode 287, is brought to you by the Axia Fusion AOIP Mixing Console. Fusion, where design and technology become one by the new Omnia 7 FM, HD, and streaming audio processor. With undo technology, Omnia 7 is a mid-priced audio processor with the sound and features you love. And by Lavo and the Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Console. Crystal Clear is the console with a multi-touch touchscreen interface. Mission, acquire and send real-time HD video and audio from a remote venue you've never seen before. Then format and distribute it to every popular computing platform known to man. It has to work right the first time, and there are no do-overs. Mission Specialist, Colleen Kelly. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack. It's episode number 287. That means we've done a lot of these things. And this show is going to be fantastic. I'm looking forward to this. We were able to pull this show together at the last minute. And uh, we've got a guest that uh, she is so interesting. And what she does for a living is amazing. But first... Let's get into uh, our co-host. He's right here. Well, he's in, I don't know where he is. I guess he's in New Jersey. Hey, Chris Tobin, welcome in. Hello. Yes, it, it is New Jersey. It's 24 degrees outside, and it's just one of those crazy cold days, unlike oh. some parts of the country where it's warmer. It, it finally got a little warmer here. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Colleen's exactly. in a warm place. Let's go ahead and bring exactly. Colleen. And Co Colleen, you've got a weather report that's envious. Uh, yeah, I'm sitting here basically overlooking a beach in Kauai, and uh, I couldn't be more perfect. I'm not even sure what the temperature is because I haven't even thought about looking it up. It's so nice. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter. It's nice. Oh, gee, man, hey, that'd be great to be there. Hey, welcome in, Colleen. Glad you're here. Glad to be here. So um, uh, Chris Tobin and I are going to be chatting with Colleen about um, massive remote broadcast that massive in terms of audience in terms of uh, maybe stature and importance and uh, uh, hey we can't afford for things to go wrong we really want these things to go right we'll be talking about the technologies that Colleen has been using compare that with uh, what Chris is using and as usual I'll just stand by and ask a few dumb questions <laughs> if you want to join us in the chat room you're welcome to at uh, gfqlive.tv and uh, you know give yourself a pseudonym there and, and ask a chat question or two our show is brought to you by uh, let's see who did I who did I say first the folks at Axia? Yeah. The folks at Axia. And, uh, you know, Axia for a little while now has had this new console, the Fusion console. And uh, Clark Novak is here to tell you about the design of the Fusion console. If you're an engineer, stay tuned. You're going to like this. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Clark Novak from Axia Audio. And I'm here to introduce you to the new Fusion AOIP mixing console, the newest modular AOIP console from Axia, the company that invented AOIP for broadcast in 2003. Let's take a quick look at some of the unique features found only in Fusion. After 10 years and more than 5,000 consoles, people constantly tell us how attractive Axia consoles are. But a console isn't designed for show, it's made to work in challenging conditions 24 hours a day, year after year. So here's a look at some of the special design choices Axia has made to ensure that Fusion meets that challenge. Some companies cover their console work surfaces with paint, which can rub off, or with plastic, which can tear or be ripped. Not Fusion. Its work surface is all metal, solid aluminum. Not only that, its double anodized markings are sealed in. They can't ever rub, peel, or flake off, which means that Fusion will still look as good in five years as it does the day you begin using it. At one time or another, we've all had the task of replacing light bulbs in console switches. Fusion does away with all that. All switches are lit with LEDs made to keep on shining for hundreds of thousands of hours. Oh, and those switches themselves are aircraft grade, specially sourced and tested by us to sustain millions of on-off operations without failure. So you won't ever have to worry about replacing those either. Fusion's frame is made from thick machined aluminum too. It's RF proof, but also lightweight. No worries about whether your tabletops can hold up. Fusion's designed for drop-in installation, and it's very low profile. No giant tub to intrude on under-counter space. Where other consoles use dot matrix readouts for channel displays, Fusion comes with easy-to-read, super-high-resolution OLEDs above each fader. They show the assigned source, tallies when talkback or other special features are enabled, and full-time confidence meters to help prevent dead air. Talent doesn't have to wonder whether that caller is dropped, or satellite feeds ready to join, they can see it clearly before they pull the fader up. 
no wipers to wear out on our rotary encoders, they're all optical. Some of the most important parts of any console are the faders. One of the reasons faders fail is from dirt, grime, and of course liquid that falls through the slots in the modules. Fusion's faders are special, premium, conductive plastic faders that actuate from the side, not the top. That way, dirt that falls through the surface slots falls past the faders, not into them. They stay smooth and silky nearly forever. That's a fast look at how Fusion consoles are designed to last and built to perform just as beautifully as they look. We'll see you next time. And thanks to Axia for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, Kirk Harnack, Chris Tobin, and our guest, Colleen Kelly-Henry, uh, are here. And let's jump right into it. Colleen, uh, before the show, you and I were talking. I, we, we were catching up because uh, uh, we worked together a little bit uh, back at another Installing network Axia, for, a, actually. for a few days. <laughs> yeah, they still have Axia there. That's great, as does this network that we're on right now. So what can you tell us about what you're doing now in general? Um, so when we met, I was working as the head engineer for Twit, which was a live internet television network. And since then, I went off to work at Google and uh, do a startup. And now I'm over at Facebook. And uh, one of the responsibilities that I tend to always fall into is um, massive live streaming, sort of, uh, I call it video special forces. Uh, there's the regular product that people are using, like, you know, Facebook's um, live streaming app from the phone or um, uploading regular videos to Facebook or something like that. But if people want to do something that's sort of outside of the standard product because it's a business need, such as our developers conference or um, maybe internal live streaming for the CEO to talk to everyone at the company. I build end-to-end -end the entire um, video infrastructure uh, to be able to do that from basically where uh, somebody hands me an HDSDI cable and says, here you go, the baseband signal's done, enjoy it, and uh, then I have to make it appear on every screen on every device reliably. Okay. Wow. All right. All right. Well, you know, it, that's not so different than what we do in broadcast. At least in radio, we do that with audio. Maybe the audience is smaller, but we do, you know, like the the broadcast to happen uh, as 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 it should. Um, you were telling me that you know one of the biggest challenges you have, and we've talked about this on our show before, is the last mile uplinking. So from from the venue, the first mile. Just, yeah, I'm first mile. Okay, yeah, do it that way. The first mile <laughs> uplinking from the venue, getting it, it into the internet, the internet infrastructure, or you know, tor headed on its way to your cloud. Why is the first mile such a pain in the butt? Well, so if I were to do a broadcast from the headquarters of a company that I worked at, that would actually be re relatively straightforward because you can burn and test the actual infrastructure there. Like if I'm going to do a broadcast, uh, say, internal to external, uh, internally I'll have encoders hooked up that will go across our, our network. We know how it works. We use it all day, every day. And then uh, if it's a non-confidential one, I'll have a um, fiber line from the switch, if you've heard of them. It's sort of like um, uh, Vivix or something like that, a dedicated yeah. fiber line. And that would be a, another off-site uplink. Um, um, if it's hyper important, I might even get a satellite truck. Um, one thing I would not do in this circumstance is use uh, like one of those backpacks that does inverse multiplexing wireless broadband. Um, one problem that people tend to run into with those is that they need to double check whether or not there are repeaters hooked up to the network uh, inside of the buildings because uh. you don't actually have a separate uplink if you have repeaters inside of there going to the same IP connection, hijacking the cell signals, and then putting them over that same connection you're already using. Then it's not a backup. <laughs> but, ah, uh, so gotcha. Maybe. Um, and so, uh, but if we're doing something like a developer's conference that's off-site, um, the problem with that is going to be that it's being set up the day before. You know, it's only a couple of hours before that thing goes live, and you're doing clap tests for audio-video sync on stage. You, you've already shared the embed code, and you're, you're, you've got some <laughs> countdown going, and you better make sure that that thing's happening. You know, one thing that uh, we had during a... Um, big developers conference last year is we had hyper redundancy for all sorts of different things but uh there was a storm in washington dc during in our um east coast satellite downlink so uh it went out now we had enough redundancy that that wasn't an issue and i love when these things happen because it proves next year or whenever when i put on the uh, list of things that i need and how much it's going to cost they're like do you really need all this redundancy and it's like well yes yes we do and this is why <laughs> so this year for example we're adding in uh even though there's only one satellite truck uplink 
hunting will be downlinking in two facilities, one in the East Coast and one in the West Coast. Um, but the, the major issue here is that you have the hyper redundancy because if you can't burn and test and actually trust the environment and make sure that the networking people on site are going to give you carved off bandwidth on a VLAN, it's like, I, I, I don't trust anyone. I got to have backup plans to everything. And then I have to have a system that makes it very easy for me to switch between these options in real time, ideally seamlessly. You know, you said something there I want to uh, focus on in just a couple of minutes, and that is I, I don't trust anyone because you can't fully trust anyone else. You, you can only trust you and the backup plans that you make. And out of, out of all the backups you make, surely one of them is going to be okay. Chris Tobin, you, you know, I want to discuss with you for a second, Chris, that um, what Colleen is going to be talking to us about, you know, is typically video and audio. Uh, that's the business she's in. And most of the people that you and I deal with, Chris, Typically, are still dealing with audio, although more radio stations are adding video to things. But this is worth – Colleen's advice is worthwhile, and I'll bet you're going to be sitting there nodding your head just like I am. Because if you got enough bandwidth for video, you got enough bandwidth for the audio. If you can what dodge you a wrench, you can dodge a ball. <laughs> yeah. What, what you don't have necessarily, though, in the types of things that Colleen does is low latency. Because in broadcasting, in radio broadcasting, sometimes we're tasked to have meaningful two-way low latency conversations. So, Chris, you've done some of this, too. Ha have you had to deal with uh, you know, getting great bandwidth reliably and low latency at the same time? Absolutely. I mean, every broadcast I've done, uh, including video I've been doing a lot lately, and I'm doing a lot of uh, web-related uh, broadcasts. And, uh, and Colleen's right. You've got to have a backup. I've always operated, and friends of mine who have worked with me and know me over the years, I basically operate under the premise of trust no one, TNO. And uh, I'll, I'll accept your offer and take your bandwidth and whatever you're willing to offer me. But uh, know this, that I'll have something in the background operating under my control and will not tell you about it because I don't want to hear about why I shouldn't be doing it or why you need to have access to it. And uh, make sure that you know there's no chance for trouble. And it's you know, and the, having bandwidth is only one piece of the puzzle. You got to have bandwidth that has path uh, packets that can travel properly. You can have 50 megabits in a really jittery network and means nothing to your, you know, to your connection. So it's not just bandwidth. Well, that, it's a that lot of things. That depends on your latency, as you were saying earlier. Now yeah. you, you did bring up the point of, um, for example, uh, that I tend to be doing live linear broadcasts of high latency, and, and that's true to a certain extent. Um, but there are also times like what we're doing now, which is where we have a live linear broadcast that's high latency for the audience, but. It, a low latency connection between us. It's much yeah. easier to get enough carved off good quality bandwidth for a video conferencing call for four people. But it's very different than if you want to actually have that going out to low latency to 10,000 people. And the fact of the matter is 10,000 people can't converse with each other in real time. You only need to have as many <laughs> as can converse at once. Um, True. Yeah. But, but there, you, you do bring up an interesting point um, as far as the, the performance of the network, um, that bandwidth is only one axis of this, right? You have, um, you have throughput, uh, good put, uh, you have latency, you have packet loss, and especially if you're using TCP-based protocols, high latency and high packet loss, it's going to back off. And that bandwidth, even if your connection is theoretically 50 megabits, will, it'll drop way down. So one of the tricks that I use is reliable UDP uplinking. So if you've heard of um, Aspera, or uh, yes. for file transfer, um, there's uh, the way that that works is they use a UDP protocol, and then on the application layer, they're actually. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to be brushing my mic. Let me. There we go. And on the application layer, they're actually doing the uh, error checking and resilience and making sure that they can retransmit it. But it's within a window, so you are absolutely adding latency, and this would not be helpful for um, video conferencing, for example. But if you're doing live linear. Give five seconds to a reliable UDP protocol like Zixi or Aspera or something like that, and you can take care of the packet loss and latency. 3% less uh, packets getting through means 3% less throughput for the most part, as opposed to TCP where it's much worse. And you can also do inverse multiplexing. Um, so if you want to have uh, multiple connections bonded, that's another thing that that protocol can do. So I, I want to go back and cover a couple of terms that you've brought up here, Colleen. Um, uh, I do want to circle back around to the SAT truck and, and how you deal with vendors that provide that. But you mentioned Zixi and Aspera, and, and Chris nodded his head like he knows what this are. Clue me in. Uh, Chris, did you want to? No, no, go ahead, Colleen. You, you have probably a better application than I have. Okay, so Aspera um, is one of the more well-known brand names for this concept, which is uh, reliable UDP transmission. So um, ah. when you're talking about the uh, two major protocols that are um, in, on use in the Internet, there's TCP and UDP. TCP yeah. is what is known as reliable. Um, it's what HTTP, what most web pages go over. Wink, nudge, there are some exceptions. Um, but um, the thing about it is that you can guarantee that it works on everything and that the packet gets there. If you're sending an email, you don't 
don't want to miss a couple of lines in the email, right? You want to make right. sure it gets there. And if it's not getting through immediately and it, there's some loss or whatever, what it does is it backs off and waits a little bit longer and then waits a little bit longer and then retransmits. Um, UDP, on the other hand, which is what most video conferencing or things like that um, are based on top of, is unreliable. It blasts a packet through and um, it either gets there or it doesn't. Um, that's all on the protocol layer. Now, if you look at like the OSI model, you go a little bit up, there's the application layer. So you can add intelligence to a protocol where you use UDP as a way of fire hosing data through, but the application has these checksums and is actually uh, asking for retransmissions if they need to. Aspera is sort of the industry standard of using that technique um, for file transfer. So like uh, Hollywood movies are sent to big, you know, like Netflix, Amazon, something like that with their uh, master grade files using Aspera. Um, but Zixi is something that's much more video native. You would use it for like linear live streaming uplinking, for example. And those are brands that are um, both selling technologies that are utilizing this technique. Um, but it's one of the things that I like to use for my uplinking because uh, not only can you add encryption and all sorts of fun stuff, but if you give it a five second window, not only are you going to get way more throughput and you can shoot that thing around the world whereas uh, TCP would way back off but yeah. you also get things like the ability to um, have uh, bonding on the connection so you can hook up multiple network connections and combine them. Okay, okay. I think I'm, I'm getting a handle on that. Tell me about when, when you're um, uh, originating a broadcast from a venue and you've got, as you said, several different paths for redundancy. You know, you've got fiber, you've got a SAT truck, you've got inverse multiplex wireless perhaps. Um, are you using different uh, hardware or software encoders for each of these different uh, paths? So the way that I treat all of these are as mezzanine contribution streams. So these are sort of the master grade stream. Then those go up to my infrastructure, and then they get live transcoded into the actual delivery formats. Okay. So then I would be using software-based encoding. Um, I might do that on my origin servers, or I might use some elemental encoders or something like that in a data center. Um, generally speaking, um, my preference is always to use X264 for H.264 encoding, but um, there's some hacks you can do if you want to get that onto like Wowza origin servers, which are the ones that I like to use. Nginx RTMP yeah. module is a great open source version of stuff like that. But um, I'm actually not since I'm going to do adaptive bitrate streaming for delivery in the end, um, I'm just trying to get these signals up that are the master sources. Then I decode them and I transcode them to, you know, 5 megabit, 3 megabit, 2 megabit, 1 megabit, you know, or 1087, 2480, however you want to, you know, divide up your signals and then package those in HLS or MPEG dash or something like that and deliver yeah. it in an adaptive bitrate way to a player. But uh, another option is you can create all of those on site, but I would much rather have um, since the bandwidth on site is so precious, I, I really mm -hmm. don't want to push my limits, right? I'd rather have yeah. one five megabit stream up and then pass that through and transcode the lower levels or something like that, as opposed to saying, create everything on site and try to uplink it on the internet. Plus, I can't do adaptive bit rate reliably if I'm creating on site and using a satellite truck. They can only do one stream, right? So uh, I told you before the show that this might happen, and indeed, he's here. Say hi, Michael. Hi. Okay, now you've said hi to everybody. We're doing a show, okay? We're doing a live show, all right? Okay. All right, show everybody what you got, and then you can go. Potato chips. Potato. They're, well, they're Doritos. They're kind of different than potato chips. Uh. Okay. All right. Say hi to Colleen. Say hi, Colleen. Hi, Colleen. Say hi, Chris. Hi, hi Chris. Hi, Chris. Say hi, son. Hi. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll see you later, buddy. Here. I'm, I'm, yeah, you can play with that, but you got to play with that upstairs. All right? He, he, <laughs> he's going to take this upstairs with him. All right, buddy. See ya. Glad you're home from school. Am I away? <laughs> yeah. Bye. Are you ready? Yep. <laughs> okay. Bye. Jeez. I hate to do that to him. <laughs> he knows we're doing a show. So, uh, uh, so Colleen, the, uh, the follow-up question I was going to ask about all the different the, the different encoding is, how is the audio typically encoded in, in these streams? Is it always AAC or are there other things that are used? So, typically you would use HEAC. Are you familiar with the difference between HEAC and AAC? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, so, the, the um, spectral band replication uh, is what's in the yeah, high efficiency. Yeah, or HAC V2 where you want to do um, like parametric stereo or something like that. Typically yeah. my sort of stuff that I'm working on is not actually stereo because it's one mic on stage and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And so um, I, I always do like HAC V1 uh, typically, sometimes AAC, LC. Um, but uh, I'm actually like one of the biggest nerds for uh, another delivery standard for video encoding. And I, I, I'll this gets into the audio encoding because of how you pair it. But 
um, I uh, have actually been doing some live streams recently in test and I'll be doing them in production soon using the VP9 video codec, which is a next gen codec, um, sort of like HEVC, uh, except that it's open source. It's uh, created by a team at Google who used to be the on two team when they, before they were acquired. Um, yeah. and, uh, they, um, uh, typically package their um, video codec in the WebM container, which is a modified Matroska container. And the uh, two audio codecs that you have choices of using are Vorbis or Opus, Opus being the superior one. So um, in general, I'm actually moving towards wanting to use Opus as my codec, not actually mm -hmm. HEAC. I'll still have HEAC around as a fallback for people, for example, on a legacy... Well, People really want to punch me when I say this, but the only platform I can't deliver VP9 to if I want to is uh, really iOS web. Any sort of native platform you can put um, a, a software decoder on, um, you know, more and more hardware devices are going to have VP9 decoding in, in hardware. Chrome does it. Firefox does it. Um, I believe that Microsoft has announced that uh, Edge is going to be supporting uh, VP9. Uh, so as that moves towards, you know, being the only next gen codec really available, I'll have, you know, there's always going to be two the master and the apprentice. There's always AM, there's FM, there's iOS, <laughs> yeah, there's Android, yeah. right? So, but I'm going right. to have more and more and more Opus, and I'm going to try to make Opus my primary, and then I'll have a fallback to uh, Opus, uh, Opus VP9 WebM in Dash, and then I'll have a fallback for legacy platforms uh, such as like HLS uh, with HAAC and uh, HA264. Okay. All right. Now you, you've mentioned a, a couple times adaptive bitrate streaming. You mentioned um, uh, uh, MPEG dash and HLS. So is mm -hmm. is the encoding and, and the segmenting for those done up in the cloud somewhere? Is that done by Wowser Absolutely. or something else? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, it depends on uh, what I'm doing. But if I were to give you a reference implementation, let's say you wanted to create your own little live streaming network at home, um, I, what I would do is I'd go, I'd sign up for a Meta CDN account because they're a, they use four CDNs, uh, but um, the, they act sort of like one, but you get the, the best performance ever. The reason I recommend them for doing it at home is that they have, unlike Akamai or any of these other CDNs, you can just go log in and make an account, right? And just like, woohoo, I'm just going to play with it. And they'll like give you your first month free or something. And like that. you said that was um, me me Meta CDN? Meta CDN, yeah. They're out of Australia. Oh. They're, they're fantastic. Um, okay. And then right. uh, I would spin up on EC2 a Wowza server, or if uh, Wowza has live transcoding, a nice little GUI, um, it does ACLC, but you can go in and modify it to HEAC. Uh, it transcodes uh, with, uh, to H.264, or because I bug Charlie, the CTO over at Wowza a lot, now VP9. <laughs> so um, okay. Okay. basically what you would do is you would send up a contribution stream to Wowza that you would run on EC2 or or Google Compute Engine, and then um, have it transcoded and packaged into Dash and HLS, and you can choose any of them just depending on the URL. Um, you just you could do like slash playlist.m3 wait at the end of your URL, and then you get HLS. You could do slash manifest.mpd, and you get Dash. It's just the same encoding packaged differently. Um, and then what I would do is I would hook Metacedia and up to those origin servers, and so you could use something like open broadcast software, um, which is like free Wirecast basically, Take in your webcams, whatever, push it up to your origin server, gets adaptive bitrate transcoded, package, pull it onto the MetaCDN platform, and now you have streams. Um, you're going to need a player. Uh, MetaCDN guys, um, uh, I've been poking them a lot for some things, and they uh, have been nice enough to open source uh, Shaka Player, the engine from Google to do adaptive bitrate streaming, with the control layer on top of it integrated, which is video.js. So you can download that player, and you can put it on a web page, hook it up to your streams, and now you have a fully adaptive bitrate platform for free other than paying for Wowza. But again, you can swap out for Nginx RTMP module if you want it. But Wowza does have a free demo for up to 10 clients or whatever, so it's, you can still set it up for free if you want. Wow. Wow. Okay. Man, making all these pieces work together. That sound, that, that, that's the stuff you've been working on the last few years, isn't it? Learning yeah, what, so what has to happen to what. I'm basically a human encyclopedia of how to be all well, the options of hooking things up and what works together and what doesn't work together and how many B frames and reference frames you can have in your H.264 encoding for device mm -hmm. X or Y or something like that. Um, it's um, it's kind of like being a plumber. <laughs> You know, what fits together, what needs to be in the truck and, you know, what order to do it in. I've, I'm going to have some follow-up questions about that. After our next break, I'm, I'm going to be asking you about, you know, where, uh, a broad, let's say a broadcaster wants to do some video uh, distribution like this. What kind of consultant would that broadcaster look to, uh, you know, to get some, some of the expertise that, that you have to help them, you know, put these things together? Chris Tobin, uh, man, uh, 
I'll tell you what, I'm going to have to process this for a while. Where, <laughs> what, what comes to your mind to ask Colleen at this moment? Um, I'm curious, when you're doing your uh, events, how do you manage your, uh, your power, utilities? Uh, what what, uh, what um, precautions or safeties or, uh, you know, protection, I guess, uh, do you go to? So, in a sense, I outsource that to somebody that I would stab if they failed and that I trust. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, there's a group called the Pixel Core that I um, work with a lot. And um, what I do is I, I hire them for these events to be responsible for the uplinking. And as far as the uh, compatibility and uh, type of encoders and uh, sort of signal flow and all that kind of stuff, um, I take a very close uh, – uh, I take a very close interest in how that's all going to happen and prescribe that very specifically. Um, and I require them to make sure that they figure out all of their redundant power with both battery backups that can, uh, for example, hold the, hold the line should power go down until on-site backup generators kick in or things like that. Um, but for the most part, and I know I said trust no one, I trust Alex. <laughs> over at the Pixel Core. Other than that, I trust no one. Um, but I've got so much stuff to worry about. I will admit, and that is a very good question, uh, that I do actually tend to outsource that one to somebody else that I trust. Well, that's fine. No, I would do the same thing. I mean, it's, you can't expect to be able to do all, but uh, power is very important. It has to be managed a certain way, and you do need to stay focused on it. So, yeah, know, absolutely. It's kind, of like a, it's kind of like a combustion engine, right? You need air, fuel, and spark, right? You need yeah. bandwidth, you need source content, and you need power. Absolutely. Cool. All right, good. That's what I was just curious about because I've talked to a few folks recently about some broadcasts I just did for uh, XM and Sirius, and it was interesting when I asked about uh, power distribution, where can I plug in and where the ground references, and they looked at me like, well, there's an outlet on the wall. I was like, okay, never mind. I'll bring my UPS in and we'll use an isolation <laughs> transformer. Yeah, yeah. And uh, thank goodness we did that because at that, that, the sports bar, they had a problem because uh, a group came in to do some other things, and yeah, they blew that breaker, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you actually bring up a very interesting point, which is um, part of the skills in, uh, in these broadcasts is that you can test all you want, but all plans change when you actually meet the enemy, right? So I could be testing Absolutely. for, let's say, a week if they want to set up in, uh, in the event center ahead of time, but they don't have 50,000 people in the audience with 50,000 mobile devices, with 50,000 laptops plugged in, with 50,000. So at Google I.O., for example, they uh, run around with actually RF detectors to find people with hotspots on that are jamming the spectrum. 2.4 gigahertz transmissions just basically don't work. So there was a year when they gave out the original Nexus 7s, and those didn't work on 5 gigahertz. They only worked on 4 gigahertz. And, uh, or sorry, uh, 2.4 gigahertz. Yeah. And they were basically useless. Um, and so let's say that you want to uh, have some sort of uh, demo, for example. That's a big one that I try to stay out of, but I warn people. Uh, if you want to have a demo on stage that involves using wireless technologies, um, you've designed and tested, uh, let's say, some like casting from a phone to another device or whatever, and let's say the phone doesn't have the ability to use anything but Wi-Fi. Um, well, now you've got so much RF noise in the spectrum, it might not work, yeah, <laughs> the demo yeah. itself. And so, yeah. but in a sense, is it disingenuous to do a hack where you can hook it up via an Ethernet cable? Maybe because that's not the product, but at the same time, nobody's going to in their home have 50,000 people clogging the spectrum. <laughs> so, right. right. You know, back, back, it seems like years ago, Steve Jobs did a demo and it didn't work because he was trying to use Wi-Fi and there was plenty of Wi-Fi in the hall. And it just occurred to me, why don't the engineers there just use some slightly out of band Wi-Fi? You know, uh, even you if can it, do that. You Even if it's a that. little so illegal at the moment. What's that? Well, you can actually carve off spectrum. So in the sense, let's say there's Wi-Fi on site. You can carve off the spectrum and specifically make like an unlisted Wi-Fi network that's only transmitting on a certain part of the spectrum. Um, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything illegal because, um, you know, my job's not, not worth getting. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't want to get fired. That's kind of the, the whole reason for all this reliability stuff is my, my first job in life is, I like my job. I don't want to get fired. And if it fails, I get fired. But also if I'm committing a felony, that, that also might get me fired. I hear you. Nobody wants to get fired. Hey, and if you're watching this show, we're going to try to keep you from getting fired. Fired. You're fired. You're watching. You're watching, watching this this week in Radio Tech. It's episode number 287. Chris Tobin is with us, and our guest is Colleen Kelly Henry. She is an expert at massive live streaming, typically of video events, large large events. Uh, uh, she mentioned Google I/O, and I know there's others uh, that that she's been responsible for making sure that. 
that signal gets out of the venue and up to the cloud and then put into formats that the masses uh, can, can enjoy easily on their mobile devices and PCs. So a lot of that technology is applicable back into radio. What can we learn uh, from what Colleen does? Uh, and, and, and in fact, Chris Tobin and Colleen have been talking about that very thing. Hey, our show is brought to you in part by the folks at Omnia and the Omnia 7 FM HD audio processor. I got to tell you, I, I own one of these myself. It's at our station's way off in the Pacific in American Samoa. And I want to tell you, we, we've been wanting to get, we wanted to bump up our processing there. Uh, we actually have a fairly competitive situation in American Samoa. And we wanted to, our FM, our our, our uh, you know flagship FM station to sound really good. And we had been using an Omnia 3 for some years. And it's very adequate, does great, sounds nice and sweet. But we wanted to get a little more punch in there. And we wanted to enjoy some of the benefits that the Omnia 7 offers, like really good remote access and incredible incredibly beautiful uh, Omnia toolbox tools to see FFT spectrum and real-time analyzer, uh, all kinds of loudness measuring devices. And of course, you can uh, crank around with the uh, the uh, undo and the declipping so you can clean up the audio that's going into it, audio that may have been a little overmastered, uh, for example. And then it's got Leif Clayson's incredible uh, uh, AGC and compression techniques and look-ahead limiting, final clipping. It does all those things. They're all built in. Plus, uh, it has available as an option an RDS encoder. So, you know, we could take out our old, old, creaky RDS generator that we had and use the fabulous new software-controlled uh, RDS encoder that's built into the Omnia 7. And we did all that in American Samoa for under $6,000. In fact, a lot under $6,000 on a street price deal on the, uh, on the Omnia 7. The Omnia 7 has most of the same features uh, as the Omnia 9. It's missing a few, of course, and a few are optional. For example, the RDS. Well, you pay a little extra to get the RDS. If you want to get simultaneous HD processing, then you can pay a little extra and get that. So you only have to you know, pay for what you need with the Omnia 7. And i got to tell you, here, here's the story. Um, I never saw this Omnia 7. It was shipped to Samoa. Our general manager put it in the rack um, and I, I accessed a remote computer there to find it on the net. It was DHCP on the network. And I used a remote computer to find it. Um, I, I'm not even sure he could uh, find it from the front panel. He just didn't know what to do. So I found it. I got into it. I changed it to a fixed IP address, and then I went to town on getting it adjusted. We put audio into it, and we were ready with the composite audio out to feed our, our old-fashioned baseband STL system. And uh, then one afternoon, uh, you know, I'm on the phone with them, and, and uh, we swap, swap the cables over. And I think we were off the air maybe a grand total of 12 seconds while some cables got moved over. And bam! Got this beautiful new Omnia 7 on the air and me adjusting it from 8,000 miles away. <laughs> it's really incredible. And that, they are delighted with it. They have RDS, of course, on the air. It just sounds great and uh, makes a great visual display in the control room, too. It looks very impressive. Uh, I want you to check this thing out, too. It's the Omnia 7. It's got all of Leif Clayson's ideas and designs in there. Uh, software upgradable, of course. And uh, the NF remote software package that you use to control it gives you an incredibly Beautiful real-time look at what's going on in the processor. Plus, it gives you audio feedback. Over your remote IP connection, you get to hear uh, what's going on with the processor. Uh, and that, that audio connection, that connection automatically is as good as your IP connection allows. So if you've got a great IP connection, you can hear linear audio from the other end. But if your IP connection is a little slower, like ours is to American Samoa, then you hear compressed audio, but you can still get ideas about the timber and the tone of the audio processor that you're doing. So check it out on the web. Go to the Telos Alliance or telosalliance.com. Look for Omnia and then look for the Omnia 7 audio processor. It's part of a great family of other audio processors, including the Omnia 9, the Omnia 1, and the big flagship, the Omnia 11. Thanks so much, Omnia, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Chris Tobin is here in New Jersey in a room full of punch blocks. Chris, I, I, I'm wondering, are you, are you ever going to take those down, or are they just kind of up there for nostalgia? Are they, are they doing stuff? They're, they're, they're it's half and half. Stuff and nostalgia. <laughs> okay. It's <laughs> slowly becoming active, but uh, it's going to take a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know you know that over time, you know, you could replace those with some IP. Oh, absolutely. Trust me, that's, that's, I'm, I'm trying to work on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, being what they are, but uh, it's, it's coming along. We're getting there. And then, and 
Colleen, I mean, look, Colleen, I have no idea how old you are, but I think you're very, very young. And you probably have never dealt with punch blocks, have you? Um, I think those are the things in my closet that are <laughs> where, like, you hook up RJ11 or RJ45 connectors if you want to, like, push them down on the thing. Oh, wow. That, you're even look, looking at a hybrid there. Chris's punch blocks are what? They're 66 blocks or like them. And uh, there's no RJ involved with, with those. They're just wires and punches. Yeah, no, I think that's how my, my ports hook up to the wires in the wall. Oh, I, yeah, that would be the chrome blocks I've, I've, with the, that's a split yeah. block 110. I've, I've never uh, done an analog based workflow, and uh, I've never worked with tape or film or anything like that. Bless you, Colin. Sorry. I, I, I hope it stays that way for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, p people like Chris and I and, and other old radio guys, we have very fond memories of splicing blocks, even though we probably, you know, cut our fingers on them with razor, bl razor blades and uh, splicing tape and gr white grease pencils. Colleen, have you ever used a white grease pencil in part of your job? I, I have I not, but I, I've definitely <laughs> suffered from my job when it comes to pain. Crimping all, or, you know, crimping ain't easy when you're doing all those Cat6 cables for Twit or something like that when yeah, you're installing yeah. the system. If you remember how ripped up my thumbs were when I was Oh, that's out. right. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But, yeah, okay, now, Colleen, you also have, uh, and we'll just digress here for a second, you also have, uh, as I recall, a great interest in automotive engineering. You have a yes. great understanding of internal combustion engines, what makes them run, and what makes them super performance. Yeah, that my my current toy is a Nissan GTR that makes maybe about 700 horsepower or something like that. Oh, and then it's yeah. always my that was always my dream car, and uh, I finally have it. So um, I guess I'm done. I beat the final boss. I'll have to make a new hobby. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, well, okay. Going forward, what are some of the technologies that are interesting to you now? I mean, 3D printing is that interesting? What oh what's, yeah, I mean, what's I, that turns you on? Sorry. Sorry, I keep talking over you because I'm an idiot. Um, oh, no, I, one of the things that I uh, worked on for about six months was a lot of uh, virtual reality stuff. And we were doing 3D printing for camera rigs. I did a live stream um, during F8, uh, which is the Facebook developers conference, where we had a 3D printed camera rig of a bunch of different cameras and stitched it together in software. Um, although this little camera that I'm holding up here is uh, sort of a production model that just came out, which is called a Gyroptic, which stitches in real time on the camera itself. You can see the three different uh, camera lenses that there. Um, so, um, and then uh, here's another camera. So I, I, I actually uh, took a picture and posted it on online yesterday. It was like, I, I clearly have the weirdest uh, uh, gear bag for cameras and such. Um, but, uh, and this actually gets to somewhere, I promise. Um, but uh, this is a light field camera. This is a Lytro Illum, um, which is, think about it, if um, uh, video today is a rectangle. This is a cube in a sense. It, it collects a volume of photons and uh, you can actually change the depth information to, to such where you can adjust the focus or you can change your perspective slightly or things like that. Um, and so uh, that actually has a lot of uh, audio ramifications uh, hmm. and virtual reality ramifications. So imagine hypothetically that you could build a camera rig um, that is either outside in where you're in a room with cameras all around or inside out yeah. where you have a camera shooting out where you collect all of the volumetric information and you can actually walk around within the room. So let's say you have a rate, let's, let's pretend you have the coolest virtual reality radio station. Ideally, you'd want to have cameras all around the room that have perspectives on absolutely everything in the room. And uh, then somebody could put on virtual reality goggles and you'd also want to have object-based audio, meaning that uh, sort of like Atmos, right? Where you know where within the scene the audio is coming from. And theoretically, somebody could put on virtual reality goggles and walk around the room and sit next to the, the person in the room and everything is in the correct space and they're perceiving it in the correct way. Wow. Wow. I'm, my head's exploding trying to think about the possibilities here and the next questions to ask. So this volumetric, well, first of all, light field camera. From a practical sense, I've heard of these things, but what what can you do either practically or theoretically with a with a light field camera that you can't do with, with a regular camera? So this Lytro Loom right here, which I, I would not say that you should go out and buy because the quality is yeah. not really as good as a DSLR, but it's yeah. just interesting. But it is a functioning light field camera that you can purchase. Um, but um, imagine now that you, instead of using it like Lytro does, which is, okay, you can refocus it later, you can change your perspective slightly, you can do a couple of little neat tricks. Imagine that you have an array of cameras. So think of it like... Um, Imagine that you have like a green screen stage almost with like, say, a radio broadcaster's desk inside of it. And then you have a um, array of, uh, you know, cameras capturing every perspective. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. you interpolate in software this sort of 
volume of photons. Okay. So um, imagine uh, if you would a uh, instead of like looking from the outside of a fish tank at a rectangle um, that is the fish tank and you can't, you can change your perspective a little bit where you can like look up, you know, a little bit below the fish or whatever. Now imagine you're in the fish tank. You can actually okay. swim around inside of it. There's a, there's a volume of it. Yeah, so yeah. the idea being that you could actually be somewhere else and change your perspective. And because of that also you can do like perfect 3d in the sense of where it's not like left eye, right eye, you know, switching the two, um, uh, you know, and assuming that the person's head is perfectly straight, but you, they could actually tilt their head and you can actually adjust for the space between their eyes not being the same on all humans. Um, uh, you combine that with microphone arrays and this sort of uh, Google uh, Otoid light stage if uh, you want to see an image of something that uh, is a sort of a similar concept. So what Russell's My Jimmies is the idea that you can actually not just create these sort of... Um, rectilinear and uh, mono or stereo representations of, um, of an experience, but actually creating something that you can be inside of. Uh, and uh, light fields are one technique of doing that with video. Another one is, of course, you can capture sort of and generate a light field and then sort of create polygon characters of the people mm. doing things and use sort of like a game engine uh, to be able to do that as well. I would think that the, 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 the data rate of presenting motion in a 3D space that you're in would, would be an incredible amount of data every second. Uh, you were absolutely correct, but I don't think we have any idea uh, right now exactly how much it can be compressed. So um, if you take a look uh. at these new codecs that come out um, over the years, as far as they're more computationally complex, but you know, there's MPEG-2, and then there's H.264, and then there's HEVC, um, or there's you know, VP6, VP8, VP9, now they're working on VP10, which has light field support in it. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, the thing is that these codecs are actually just evolutions where they become more and more complex and they can find more and more redundancy, both spatially, which is within the picture, within the rectangle, or temporally, which is between frame to frame to frame to frame. Um, I don't think there's been that much research or work done yet on compressing light fields. And for all I know, uh, for all we know, it could actually be you know, some more data, but not that much more data. And then let's say that you divide up the... So, Part of a light field's concept is imagine a cube around your head. And if the light field is, say, a one meter cube light field, that means that you can change your perspective or look around wherever your head is within that one meter cube. Now you pull your head out of it and you're screwed. But let's say that you just had a very good internet connection. You want to do something like Dash or HLS where you segment it. Let's say it's like Legos where when you move forward, there's a cube that comes in front of your face and then a new cube. And then you get rid of it and you stream oh, yeah. down the data. Sure, so sure. There's a lot of ways that you can sort of break up. Because like, if you want to start watching Iron Man on Netflix, you're only watching what you need. You're not necessarily downloading two hours into it. So yeah. do you need to stream, for example, what's behind the kettle in the kitchen if you're not looking behind the kettle yet? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So all the info doesn't have to be there. Just what you're perceiving needs to be there, obviously. Correct, but it needs to be there yeah. exactly at the moment that you're perceiving it, and uh, ideally in under 20 seconds motion to photon, meaning when you move your head, it better be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, 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 I get that. Hey, you brought up one thing, that you, you mentioned frames, and I wondered, will we ever break through or go past the concept of you know, stoppages in time, 24 or 30 or 60 or 120 times a second, will we ever reach a complete fluidity in our our ability to capture physical motion visually that doesn't involve uh, think, frames. Uh, the sampling in a sense. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I don't think that, um, I think it'll be theoretically possible to a certain extent, uh, but you would have to have the entire chain all the way through up into the display being able to do that because displays refresh, for example. So is there any matter, is there, is there any reason to have, a com if your display can only do 60 frames per second, but you're streaming 120 or, you know, some theoretical thing where it's perfectly smooth vector motion, like, does it, does it matter if the weakest link in the chain is still going to turn into frames at some point? But let's say that you could, does it matter? I don't know. 
Um, I, I, I don't know either. I, maybe I was thinking of, of uh, you know, if you relate this to how we think about um, atmospheric sciences, we take as yeah. much of a snapshot of the entire atmosphere as we possibly can in, in the weather world, uh, and then we do calculus to figure out where all the particles are going to go, uh, and then we compare that with the next snapshot that we take, and we see where we were wrong, and, you know, did, did a butterfly flap its wings in China and, you know, cause a tornado in Kansas. Um, right. Uh, so so it, we, we use a lot of calculus in, in, in weather prediction it might be interesting to make everything particle based and then do calculus uh you know anyway i'm talking about way in the future and it may never happen it may not be important no, no, i think it's a very interesting it. question both philosophically and and from an engineering perspective um i'm wondering whether or not it matters in the sense of um let's say that the actual psychovisual perception uh of your eyes or the audio or psycho audio what do you call it? Uh, Psychoacoustic perception. Um, So you're actually rattling bones in your ears, right? And you're actually uh, manipulating liquid uh, slash, you know, chemical, uh, like photo red or whatever in your eyes. And um, even if you could make it uh, better and useful in some way, scientifically speaking, I wonder if beyond, say, 120 frames a second or whatever, if there's any psychovisual um, benefit to having that level of fluidity. Uh, because in the end, it is turning into some sort of analog signal in your brain. And is, and is that just, um, you know, you're beyond the, the visual fidelity of perception at that point? Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I do think what one thing that's interesting would be to do that for... Um, a lot of effects um, that may be rendered out into something different. So, for example, um, like if you have a, a green screen, you're going to want to shoot that in 444 color space, but I'm going to stream it in 420 color space. The reason I'm doing that is I can pick out those hairs and chroma key into the background, whatever actually I want to do in editing. And then once that's done, I'm, I'll rip out most of the color data, you know, a quarter of it and deliver it to the person because people can't perceive it. But during the workflow, it's essential to have that color data while you're doing that um, technique, right? So I think, for example, recording without frames would be absolutely amazing. I'm not sure that delivering without frames will ever be necessary. I could be totally wrong. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was thinking a bit, a bit about how the, how the eye on the retina works. To my knowledge, your eyes don't work. In frames, I could be wrong. I don't really. I don't know the, the don't, physics exactly. of it. No, they don't. So, so uh, let's relate this to that now. We've gone off far afield, which is very interesting. Let's see if we can relate any of this back to audio, because in audio, we would digitally we deal with samples. And uh, Colleen, you just mentioned that, that you're in in editing in in color space four four four. And once you once you're done with all the fine high resolution stuff, you're going to get rid of the color information you don't need. And four two zero is a typical way to send that out. It's n- not so different for audio in terms of what we compress, what we don't compress. So when Absolutely. we deal with audio in in a production standpoint we we really try not in any way to deal with uh video with audio that's been data reduced psychoacoustically uh we always want to deal with uh linear with you know the same samples that we 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 got do you see some correlation there are you kidding me all video and audio are the same exact thing it's all just waves and the whole point is you want to make sure that you're not screwing up the waves until the very end of the system and you rip out everything that people can't perceive and then deliver as much compressed but ideally as little uh, psychoacoustic or psychovisual loss as possible. Video encoding and audio encoding are basically the same thing. Um, and so even video and audio delivery are basically the same thing. They just have different bit streams. One of the things that uh, I was thinking we should probably talk about before the end of the show, for example, is how you can use something like MPEG Dash for um, uh, adaptive bitrate video delivery in uh, HTML5. So even though this is typically a video technology, you could use it for live linear streaming on a radio station. But what's interesting there is that you can adapt up and down depending on the bandwidth of the connection, right? So whereas right. most people uh, do it for um, audio or for video because video is much harder to be able to get that much through the connection, uh, you could hypothetically have uh, the ability to adapt uh, in real time from, say, a lossier. Uh, very low bandwidth uh, audio quality to say a CD quality audio quality to why not lossless audio. One thing yep. that I don't understand in your world though, although I can maybe guess why, is why there's not more production done using losslessly compressed audio codecs, considering that audio is so, and you're going to punch me for this, easy. And I mean easy in the sense of bandwidth. A lossless audio stream you can put over a network relatively straightforward. Uh, uncompressed audio you can also put over a network pretty straightforward, but computationally making it 
losslessly compressed is really not that much of a hit. I wonder why, uh, and maybe you can speak to this, there's not more um, uh, lossless audio used in your world. That's a, that's a great question, uh, and and I, I think a lot of it has to do with the least common denominator and no must, no fuss for the end user. Then that there are lossless or FLAC-based audio services out there, or there have been, I don't know if they still are, that you can subscribe to. You, you can either download files or you can stream in very high quality, uh, typically uh, lossless like, like FLAC. Um, but but you, you've, you've talked several times about adaptive bitrate, either Apple HLS, yep. there's, of course there's Microsoft Smooth Streaming, and, uh, and no, MPEG Dash. And... and <laughs> Th these are just now becoming popular. Are there? They, I mean, there's some products from Telos and products from other companies too that are geared toward letting radio broadcasters and other audio content creators uh, stream with, with these. In fact, I've been doing seminars on Apple HLS. In fact, I just built a PC across the room here where I'm streaming Apple HLS. And before this show, I had to take my wife to the airport. I'm driving around town streaming at whatever bit rate the phone was able to do uh, from the, the PC here using Apple HLS. So yeah, it's it, it's coming, and I think it's huge benefits um, for for um, uh, broadcasters and, and and for listeners. And just you know, the the, the thumbnail sketch on that is you get to you you get adaptive bit rate. You get within a certain number of different bit rates that the uh, content creator wants to provide. And you know, the highest bit rate could be very high. It could could be linear. Um, uh, we happen to typically choose like uh, I think uh, if you want to be on the on iTunes Radio, you need to have 256 kilobits available, and then you can have lower bit rates available. Typically, three different lower bit rates, or you could do four, whatever you want. Um, but yeah, you you could do you could do linear and and uh, um, so lost, Chris, what do, what are your your thoughts about the future of streaming there and, and with adaptive? Well, um, if radio, we'll call it as an industry, wants to survive, they better take it and run with it because uh, Colleen's correct. It is simple. Audio is a simple thing to do. It can be tricky, and sometimes people take for granted how good audio can be to tell a story. So um, adaptively, if you, if you had the ability to deliver your content uh, using adaptive bit rate uh, technologies, you could actually corner the market in places where bandwidth is so limited. Maybe you know, you're in Kenya, and uh, the, the cellular network, the GSM network, has a very low bandwidth, but you're able to actually get something out of it. Or maybe you're in parts of the United States where cellular service is so limited and uh, terrestrial broadband is that your cellular service with the low bandwidth connection you have, the adaptive bit rate actually will get the audio through. Since you're not putting any video across, you can definitely get audio out. And that enhances the experience for the end user, the listener, if you want to call it that. And uh, yeah, the industry needs to start looking that way. To answer your question, Colleen, as to why we as broadcasters don't do some things that make sense, a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's always been done this way, and uh, the industry is so risk averse that um, you know trying something new. Well, I guess the old saying goes, "I never got fired for buying IBM," and that, that's that's really what it comes down to. Makes sense. Yeah, I was actually just using that yesterday as a description for a very similar problem in the in the sort of YouTube slash uh, Facebook software engineering world. Colleen, it, it yeah. appears to me that you you in your job you might have really a whole lot of options and opportunity to try newer technologies with the caveat that as long as it plays back in a browser, at least for a, a good percentage of what you do, uh, you can do whatever you want as long as the end product will play back in a browser. Yes, as long as it works and is flawless, and uh, which is almost impossible considering the, the it's basically me and maybe one other person and we basically have to build an entire platform and you know, internet television network, but, um, the, uh, the tech, they don't care how you get there so long as it works. Um, now when you work in a place where you have a bunch of other engineers and other broadcaster, you know, sort of engineers or software engineers, and they all start to think they know what they're doing. They all start to have opinions and your options get limited. But at the same time, I find in my world that the, um, requirements drive the adoption of next gen technologies because for example, um, Let's use Flash as an example. Flash was the way that people were uh, constantly using to be able to stream audio in real time or video in real time. Um, one of the issues is that, um, uh, for example, HTTP delivery, so RTMP was a protocol that was only available in Flash. And you could open a connection, you could stream live, very low latency, ongoing. Um, the, uh, the thing for video, um, when they wanted to go to HTML5, or even audio, same thing, if you wanted to have an ongoing stream that was live, you had to have segment, 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 right? Um, 
generally speaking, when uh, then people say, for security reasons of the company, we got to get rid of Flash. Well, all of a sudden, it's like, okay, well, let me take a look at the technology space. Oh, wait, in HTML5, I can use Opus. Well, now all of a sudden, like, oh, I can use VP9. It actually, because people are saying, it's got to be this, it's got to be HD, it's got to be, it's like, well, you got to let me use the next-gen stuff because it's the only way that it's actually going to work. I can't <laughs> yeah. exactly, yeah. I mean... I can't do RTMP in HTML5. It just doesn't work that way. Like, I have to start doing Dash. I have to start doing next-gen codecs. Um, so there's, uh, it, there's more of a acceptance of change because the requirements, uh, I think, are moving faster. And so long as you're meeting the requirements, they don't care how you do it. Cool. All right. Hey, uh, we've got to take a, a quick break. We're going to come back with um, some tips from uh, Colleen and uh, hopefully from Chris as well. Caught Chris off guard with that. Our show is brought to you in part by our friends at Lavo, L A W O, German company that makes audio consoles. Usually they make big honking audio consoles, but they have this really cool little console for uh, typically for radio called the Crystal Clear. And we've got a portion of a little video here where Mike Dosh uh, is describing the Crystal Clear. Let's see if we can roll that clip. Go ahead. So, Crystal Clear is maybe the first of several different ideas that we've got for how to approach radio in a, in a new way. And a lot of customers are very excited about this. So let's take a look at some of the features here. It looks familiar. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got fader channels and faders. Uh, in this particular case, we've got sources that we've configured, microphones. Uh, we've got uh, network audio inputs. We've got telephones. And we've got uh, codecs. And all of these are available to the user all at the same time to make a radio show. We have a monitor section, so this is going to control our loudspeakers. We have headphones. Uh, we can talk to our studio guests, for example. Maybe we have people in the other room in front of microphones. They've got headphones on. I can talk to them. Essentially, it's a full-function radio control surface that is controlling our crystal engine and making all of the mixes in the DSP. Let's take a look at some of the deeper features. If we go underneath a fader channel, for example, it brings up a block diagram to show us what that fader channel is doing behind the scenes. We have output assignments like program one, program two, and a record bus. And then we have a couple of interesting functions. One of them is called auto gain. And, and this is something that's new and it's unique to Lavo. If we push this button, we can now speak into a microphone. And as we speak, the microphone gain will be adjusted and it will automatically be leveled to the appropriate level for this particular show. We can do that for the host, we can do it for guests. It's not uncommon for a guest to be a little mic shy at the beginning of a show. So even in the midst of a show, we could open this up and we could push it and we could adjust it for the more exuberant guest who becomes more confident during the course of the show. Auto mix is another feature that's unique to Lavo consoles. Auto mix, if we select it here, this channel now becomes part of a group that can automatically set levels depending on what it is that we wish to do. Now this might be useful for, let's say we're running a talk show and we want the host to always talk down the guests. So if the host starts talking and the guests are talking at the same time, maybe we want the host to be a little bit louder and the guests to duck down during that time. Well, this can all be set up during auto mix. Another application for it is Setting, I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, stop the, uh, the stop the video there. You can see the rest of this video uh, online at the Lavo website. Go to lawo.com and look for radio products and look for the Crystal Clear uh, mixing console. It's a virtual radio mixer, and that exact video that you just saw a part of right there is on that web page. You can. It's about a six minute demo that Mike Dosh takes you through the Crystal Clear audio console. It's really amazing if, if the touch technology, multi touch, ten fingers at once, and uh, the console really behaves. You know, like like you'd expect it to. It just does does what you need it to, and it works with their their Crystal uh, mixing engine that has all the inputs and outputs and Ravenna and AES sixty seven networking built in. Thanks to Lavo for sponsoring this portion of This Week in Radio Tech. All right, for this show, uh, Chris Tobin's been with us, and uh, Colleen Kelly-Henry has been with us as well. Uh, Colleen, uh, maybe you've got a tip that you can pass along to us from Kauai today. Uh, can I do it after uh, Chris so that I can yeah, think Yeah, sure, ab ab okay. absolutely. No, no, no worries. Or maybe a helpful website you, you've, you've come across. Chris Tobin, you got any advice on 66 blocks? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't. 
66 blocks? Sure. By the way, my audio, I just got a zap of static, so I'm using a mic on the webcam and a oh, speaker man. on the output of the PC. Wow. Of course, you do remotes, things like this do happen. So if you want to do a 66 block, sure, why not? we got a punch tool right here. How's that? So, so um... You want the actual yeah, block itself? For engineers who don't know, because a lot of engineers have not used these kind of blocks, uh, what you, you you pull the wire through, you you drag it what down across the the fork that's in there, and then you use a tool to push the wire down in there. And the tool does two things. It well, it does three things. It pushes the wire into that fork. It strips uh, or the the fork itself strips the insulation off and makes contact. And then the tool can, if you're using the the right blade, will cut. The wire off. Hopefully, you've got to turn to the correct end. You're not cutting off the important side, but you're cutting off the uh, the leftover side of the wire. Yep, that's what you do. It's an in, uh, what do you call it? Insertion displacement connection (IDC). That's so, right, IDC, insertion displacement connection. Yeah. I developed the phone a couple of many years ago. They discovered that by doing it that way, the the fork, when the wire goes between it, the solid wire, not stranded, it creates yeah. automatically sealed connection between the two pieces of metal, and an oxidation uh. takes. Well, we don't use those very much in radio stations, but you know what? You, every radio station probably has some of these left over, maybe from the telephone supplier, because they still use these. Sometimes these little cute little bitty ones, you know, with just a few phone lines on them. Uh, and your phone service may still come into the building that way if you're not already on voice over IP. Uh, by the way, those blocks, they did design some to behave pretty well. Uh, in a uh, you know in, in in a Cat Five cable situation, uh, I don't know if they I don't I wouldn't think they work for gigabit connections, but they they worked for ten and one hundred megabit connections. They changed the spacing between the the rows just a little bit to make them a bit more balanced. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the, the six six blocks are still fine because they were very popular for a long time for audio distribution and whatnot. But for the tips, here's something people must remember. Right? You can use this for now. What? You can use this for audio over IP connections. And data. The tip I have for this, and this is guaranteed to work for everybody. Inside is the typical. Here we go. The tools that you need for making uh, Cat5, Cat6 connections, RJ45s, and this one does yeah. all of them as well. But what's important to remember, because you know you can't always remember all the details. So if I ask you, I need a crossover cable. We got to hook up two computers, two pieces of equipment that are DTE devices or DCE. How do I make a crossover cable quickly? Can anyone say? You may not be able to remember. Why should you? you don't do it every day. But you should put this in the box. In the box! Oh, my gosh. In the box with your tools. But then again, you say, wait a minute, I don't make crossover cables all the time. That's right. Because then you should have the second piece of paper, which will be, how do you make a straight-through cable? Uh, See? Yeah. Put this, it tells you the top and the front and where pin 1 and pin 8 are. Okay? You know... I've done this for years. People have laughed at me. But one day, a couple of months ago, a gentleman came in, an IT uh, person. It was actually a company we had hired... Uh, they came in to do some work, and the guy goes, oh, can I borrow your toolkit? I'm like, sure, what do you got to do? He's like, i got to make a couple of cables. I said, are you familiar with the, the color codes? He goes, yeah, I think I can remember them. I said, all right, take the kit. We'll see what happens. He comes back to me. He goes, wow, I never thought to even think of that. I said, yeah, well, that's good. So you owe me money now. <laughs> you, you know, I'm, I'm glad that kit has the paper in there. That's smart. I cannot tell you how many times I have Googled RJ45 color codes. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, you know, you, you, I, I have worked in many environment at two o'clock in the morning, where it's sometimes a location on mountaintops or you know, top of skyscrapers where the internet connection was not really available, or at the time it was just not it was not good because we had no power, and because we're there, things had to happen. I learned this a long time ago. Plus, after managing several dozen different tech ops centers and having people make the cable wrong and do something goofy, I was like, "That's it. This is how we're going to start doing things." And sure enough, it pays off. So it's, that's my tip. Put the, put the information in the box with the tools, and you'll be surprised yes. how it will go. I'll put that to use. I'll Google it, and then I'll print it out, and then I'll put it in my toolbox. That's true. I'll, I can even tape it to the top of the, of the box. No, no, no. Put it inside the box. Don't just tape the top. You know, no, no. I mean it. inside. Tape it inside. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. guess you could do it. Well, it's got foam. Yeah, you could do it. Colleen, what, what do you tape inside of your Go kit? <laughs> uh, well, I always have an HDMI or HDSDI to USB 3.0 adapter. Um, what, so what, 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 what brand? Like? 
uh, mage well. Um, so the thing about like black magic or anything like that is I find that they require special drivers to work with things, but the mage well ones are the ones that work with video for Linux too, or AV foundation, or they just show up like a normal webcam and oh, cool. it just works. I can use it with FFmpeg or I can use it with, you know, Wirecast or open broadcast wow. software and they're small and light. They had kind of a funky cable. I kind of like the plastic black versions that they had originally because it was a standard USB 3.0 cable as opposed to the new one, whether it's like USB A to USB A, which is very weird. Um, so uh, yeah. I worry that if I lose the cable with it, that it's going to, um, that I'm going to have the device, but not the right cable. So I tape the cable to it. Um, but I'm not going to take it off to use it with something else because nothing else uses it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so did, but, did, did you have a different tip for us or do you, or do you want to make that your tip? Um, I would I would make that my tip as far as signal acquisition, but I do have a different tip for you, which is uh, MPEG dash streaming and HTML5 for audio. So um, I would bet that a lot of your listeners who have internet radio stations right now are still using Flash, and I would recommend that they take a look at using MPEG dash, not HLS. HLS is only working in HTML5 on Android badly, on iOS and on Safari on the desktop, and now Microsoft Edge. Uh, HLS is sort of an inferior choice. MPEG dash is really what you want. MPEG dash works on everything with the exception of Safari. Safari web um, for oh, mobile. Okay. So, um, but in general, you can have the same bit streams muxed in either one, so it doesn't really matter. Um, you can just have something like a Wowza server or an Nginx RTMP server. You send the audio stream in, you mux it, you deliver via HTTP. Uh, players that you might want to use would be Shaka Player or um, Video.js or um, uh, the Bitmovin player, but just because they're designed for video doesn't mean you can't use them for audio for HTML5 exclusively and with adaptive bitrate if you want. And if you want more information about that, I would recommend going to the Wowza forums because they have a lot of good information there. Cool. I did a, a webinar with Wowza uh, about a month ago, and it was uh, pretty informative. So uh, I'll look up. I'll look in the Wowza forums about information about that. Cool. Thank you so much, Colleen, for being with us. I appreciate it very much. And thank you, uh, Chris Tobin, for being with us. Colleen came to us from Hawaii. It's a better place than you and I are in, Chris. Well, it's a matter of perspective, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've been to that island. It's a very nice place. I did enjoy it. I look forward to going back. So, yes, I'm somewhat envious, but I understand. It's well worth it. Thanks a lot to our sponsors as well. And, hey, coming up next week, Colleen, I think you know our guest next week. Our guest next week is Dick DiBartolo, the, uh, oh, the I know Ma Mattis I Mad Writer. Yeah, and so he's going to talk to us about really uh, fun gizmos, hopefully some of which we can use in broadcast audio production, and then we're going to kind of get back into some engineering shows where we talk about heavy-duty broadcast engineering, and I'm going to be putting up an IP radio link 17 miles and running linear audio over that. It's going to be interesting. I'll, I'll report back to you, and we'll see how to take some pictures and some video. I'll try to take the... Uh, the, the GoPro cam if I climb the tower to do any of that work. So uh, so thanks again, folks, for being with us. Thanks to Suncast for producing our show and Andrew Zarian for founding the GFQ Network. Tell your friends about it. And join us next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>